Our next speaker, uh, Larry Cohen, is the president of one of America's most important labor unions, the Communication Workers of America. It's the largest telecommunications union in the world, but it also represents workers in a wide range of industries, including broadcasting, cable TV, journalism, manufacturing, airlines, customer service, government service, health care, and education. <laughs> Larry is one of the most effective and energetic labor leaders I've come to know in 35 years of working with labor unions. Uh, and one of his particular passions has been solidarity with the international labor movement. Even before he was elected president in 2005, <coughs> he expanded alliances with CWA's counterpart unions in Latin America, Europe, and Asia. He served as president of the 2.5 million member Union Network International Telecom Sector and continues to serve on the World Executive Board of, of UNI. Uh, and he also was the person who came up with the idea of having uh, Luis and, and made the connection with what was happening in Brazil. So I'm indebted to him uh, in any number of ways. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Russ. Uh, since I do live here, uh, I'm going to be really quick. So maybe we can get some conversation going. There's two more folks after me. I see what time it is. So um, I was going to do more on this, but I'm going to speed it up. Uh, that doesn't mean talk even faster than usual. But I'm <laughs> to do that too. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about really here is step back and, and look at the context, um, particularly uh, the Brazilian case. And, and let me first say I think the work of SACOM is unbelievable. I mean, this is heroic work. Uh, we should all think about, would we do that work if, if we were in Debbie's shoes? I mean, that's really brave and wonderful work you're doing. Thank you. Uh, and as Debbie said at the end, uh, a critical factor here is really uh, what are the rights of workers? And not so much sort of how do we document what's going on, which is a lot of what you just did for us. And we saw a contrast in Brazil. And I think, Russ, is this chart available for everybody? I, I believe it is. It should be in every Yeah, so I'm not going back over it, but you all should grab this chart. Because what you see in like two seconds, in fact, we should put the U.S. down there. Because the, the basic kind of rights, this is uh, down one side is wages, vacation pay, work week, uh, minimum wages, lunch subsidies, down to um, child care leave, severance, unemployment insurance, health care, profit sharing. And you see China, Brazil, we actually need to, we ought to add in U.S. to maybe send that out over email. I could have done that, didn't. Um, but what's striking here is what happens when workers have rights, their own rights, not what we do for them, uh, not what we so much document, but ha how do workers rise up, have a movement of their own that they control, build a political movement along with it, and then what are the results? And so, you know, when I look, Luis, at Brazil, you know, I know a little bit about Brazil, not like Brian or you, but, but um, you look at Brazil over a 25-year period. 25 years ago, people like me and Luis were locked up. People like me and Luis had no rights at all in Brazil. There was no political democracy in Brazil. Uh, Lula da Silva and others formed a PT uh, that Luis is a part of, the Party of Workers. They started from scratch. Uh, amazing journey, which, again, I'm not going through because of the minutes we have here. But... They linked together in Brazil uh, the fight for jobs, the fight to end poverty, the fight for three meals, as Lula called it, uh, but most importantly, the rights to organize your own union, as Luis's union did, metal workers, uh, in this section of Brazil over a period of many, many years. And so 25 years ago in Brazil, there basically was no bargaining rights. One of the few places, even lower bargaining rights than in the U.S. at that time. Today in Brazil, almost 40% of workers have bargaining rights in Brazil. From near zero to 40. Linked to the Workers' Party, a political movement that fought for democracy, that fought for jobs, that fought to end poverty, that fought for health care, that fought for three meals, and built a labor movement at that time from scratch at huge risk. And that's the story, not just of Lula da Silva that we all know, but of an entire movement of millions of people that continues to move on. What Debbie's really saying to us is that 
you know, how does that happen in China, given the current situation? And it's obviously your work and others like you that maybe one day soon, hopefully, can help create that situation. But meanwhile, amazingly enough, even in China, what you see on this chart, or actually on the chart you put up, is uh, at least in the Shanghai region, wages increasing. Uh, prices are also increasing, though. And current projections are, and this is our problem, and this is what I'm going to talk about, that in five years in the Shanghai region, wages in China will be the same as production workers in the United States. Now, why is that? Because production workers in the United States haven't had a raise in 35 years. 35 years. And for production workers in the United States in those 35 years, we've gone from one-third of workers, a little bit lower than Brazil today, with bargaining rights in this country, to now one out of 15 in the private sector, and plunging. Uh, today, this minute, in Burlington, Iowa, G workers who are members of our union are voting on whether they can have bargaining rights at that company. Uh, we're in an alliance with many unions at GE. We're the largest union. <clears throat> in this country, at this time, it's absolutely fine for that plant manager every single day to tell those workers, if you vote yes, I'm closing the plant. Ask Luis, could that happen, Luis, in Brazil? I have my own way from Philadelphia of answering that, but the answer is no. <coughs> Yeah, it's enraging. <coughs> Second point, trade policy. Why is Apple producing in Brazil? Look at the chart. The wages and benefits is three or four times higher than in China. Why? Because until two years ago, huge tariffs are slapped on every Apple product. You don't see iPhones in Brazil. Huge tariffs called trade policy. I mean, they made the deal, Brazilian government made this deal with Foxconn and Apple. They said, how much money will you invest? Ten billion dollars. How many jobs will you create? Ten thousand jobs. And workers here in Brazil, Foxconn and Apple, have rights. They will have a union. They will organize if they choose to. There'll be no interference. Now, it's not perfect. So think about this. On our watch, mine, president of a large union, here's the story of the United States, a sled ride downhill, no trade policy, we revel in Apple, the board of directors of Apple is almost all Democrats. It's not just Al Gore, the chairman Art Levinson, all Democrats. The question for us is, how do we build a political movement that links workers' rights, economic justice, and democracy, almost from scratch. That's what we're down to here, virtually from scratch. Inspiration, Brazil. Inspiration, Workers' Party in Brazil. Real results, it's not just Brazil. It's Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, South Africa, and even Taiwan has a movement, Foxconn is a Taiwanese company, even in Taiwan there's a movement for democracy and workers' rights and it's not good there, but they're rising, not falling. They're rising, not falling. This week is what we call the 99% spring. Hopefully most of you are signed up for spring training. It's not baseball. It's workers' rights. It's democracy. It's economic justice. 60 organizations, a few of them labor, mostly all kinds of other groups have put this together. 60,000 people at 800 sites are signed up for the spring training. There's 10 sites in Washington. Three of them are at CWA, but there's a, a churches at GW, mostly this Saturday and Sunday. That training, seven hours. It's a shorter version, some of the night ones. It's also online. There's number one about the economy and what's happened to it. So we have a common narrative. The plunge in real wages, the rise. Average CEO now gets 400 times what a frontline worker gets. And the collapse of the democracy. 
the role of the billionaires in totally controlling, virtually totally controlling, there are exceptions, our political process. The worst Senate rules in the history of the U.S. Senate, and that's saying something. How these things fit together, the collapse of the democracy, voter suppression, no legalization path for immigrants. How the collapse of the democracy here fits with the economic justice issues of falling wages, the health care crisis, retirement security being destroyed, and most importantly from our point of view, as Debbie said it, virtually no collective bargaining rights in this country. And where they exist, as we all know, the worst attack ever. That's part one. Part two, how do you tell that story in your own words, if you're a worker or if you're one of us who you know, maybe works in one of these organizations? How do you do it in your own words, you know, from your heart, with passion? And part three of the training is, how will we take direct action this spring against these corporations, instead of moaning and groaning and writing and all those other things we all do, direct action in the streets, at the shareholders' meetings, starting next week. That's what we're doing. And 100,000 people total, both online and on site, will be trained in this, and we will take to the streets, and we will take these companies on. And hopefully, as Occupy did, as students and others did in Madison, Wisconsin a year ago, as our own workers did at Verizon, who are still fighting, we have 150,000 workers in our union alone with no contracts. They're not going to give up. They're not going to cave in to the bullshit that goes on that they get offered by corporate America. We will fight those fights as long as it takes, as long as it takes. And these are all parts, whether it was the Verizon workers' strike, which was meant as a wake-up call for two weeks, or any of these other companies for our union or for other unions, or more importantly, for people who, like these workers in Burlington, Iowa today, have no real chance to ever have any rights. Or the T-Mobile workers, and as Russ said, we do a lot of global work. So at T-Mobile, we formed a joint union with the biggest German union, Verdi, to say to Deutsche Telekom, the parent, that just because you're in the United States doesn't mean you get to take the lowest road in the United States and fire and torture workers here who join a union. And Deutsche Telekom, including T-Mobile workers right now in Germany, are on a strike wave to try to keep their pay and living standards where they are or higher. And very emotional to me, they carry signs about the crushing of workers' rights at T-Mobile in the United States. Not just their own fight, but ours. Thousands of them have been involved in this. Last year they all but stopped the shareholder meeting of Deutsche Telekom when a thousand Verdi members showed up. And so, Ross, I think it's on the one hand, mo most of us live here. We need to build a movement that's real, not bullshit, frankly. Too late to keep saying, most important election ever, most important election ever. We need to be saying, most important time ever to build a movement for workers' rights, for economic justice, and for democracy. And yes, the elections make a difference, and we get active in the elections. But the election can no longer be an end in itself. If we didn't learn that in 2008, shame on every one of us here. We need to figure out and take inspiration from these two stories and from many other stories around the world, whether in North Africa, Tunisia, or wherever else, that it takes a movement to change these things. Not just a labor movement, but a political movement. And when you have a movement, what the results in Brazil show us is it makes an enormous difference. You want to sell your products here in Brazil? There'll be unions. You want to sell your products here in Brazil? You have to invest here billions of dollars. You want to sell your products in Brazil? You'll have to hire workers who have rights, who have guaranteed vacations of a month or more. I mean, go down this list. Guaranteed paid childcare leave. Guaranteed paid severance. As Luis said, if you hire them and then fire them, you're going to pay. And on and on. Guaranteed national health care. And on and on and on. And so, you know, we have a choice. We can continue to sit back and moan and groan. Apple's basically a U.S. company. It's the biggest company in the world, as Russ said, by market value. The main consumer market for that company is here. They do do some good things here. They do hire people in their stores. They don't produce here. When Steve Jobs was asked last year, why don't you produce in the U.S.? He said, in China, the workers sleep next to the factory. And, you know, he was a maniac, as most people know. And so when I want to change something little about the product, I can wake them up in the middle of the night. They will come out to come to work. 
They'll work 12 hours a day, six days a week. I can't do that in the United States. So why would I produce here? Well, you can't do that in Brazil either. But they want to sell products in Brazil, so they have rules. And that difference is all the difference in the world. Thank you.